morning. Welcome to Osco Community Church. Merry Christmas. It's a little early, but I mean, with the music, with the decorations, we just got to say it as much as we can. So there we go. Just have a few announcements as we get started today. Uh, after Sunday school today, we are having our annual meeting up here in the sanctuary. Uh, members, we very much encourage you to attend. If you're not a member, you can still attend. Uh, see what we're doing and what the plan is for the new year. Uh, if you need information still about what we're going to be talking about and voting on, there is the table in the back by the information center that has information on that with budgets and proposed changes to the Constitution and all that good stuff. Coming up not too far away is going to be Christmas, and with Christmas comes the Christmas store for Awana. We still need donations for that. Uh, we also need uh, gift wrappers uh, the night of on the 21st, so if you are able to help with that, we encourage you to come on out that evening for that time, and uh, we appreciate all the help we can get. Uh, we also need help uh, on Christmas Eve. The Cambridge Community and Youth Center is having uh, their... Um, community lunch, and they need help with servers as well as people. If you can make bread, they would like that as well. So you can talk to Doreen if you would like to help with that, if you have questions on that. Talk to her. Also, we are having our Christmas Eve service uh, at 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve on that Saturday. Uh, Christmas Day service will be at the normal bat time, normal bat hour at 9 o'clock in the morning. Same bat channel, that's right. And uh, if you would like to, uh, we still have these in the back. If you'd like to invite a neighbor, a friend to uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas service, information on that is on the back of these cards as well as our uh, December sermon series. Uh, so, yeah, make use of those. Uh, I think that's it. So let me, let's uh, go to prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this time of year in which we can remember and rejoice in the greatest gift that has ever been given. Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for the wonder that God became flesh so that we might become uh, your sons and daughters. Lord, we thank you so much for the honor, for the privilege, for the wonder of this season. Lord, we thank you and pray that you would bless our hearts with reminders of these truths from your word this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.
Father, we thank you for the joy of music. We thank you that even in this way, we can be like the angels proclaiming your birth. Father, I thank you that we can come this morning, that we can be part of this celebration of Emmanuel, God with us. And Father, as we continue this morning, I pray that in each of our hearts, you will remind us that you are in fact with us that the manger is empty, the tomb is empty, and the cross is empty, and that you are alive and with us. May we be blessed as we celebrate this morning. In Jesus' name. See you. 
As Mary thought on the things the angel had told her, she certainly must have been filled with wonder to think that God had passed by the rich and mighty to allow her in her humble state to usher in this greatest of all events. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for my soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for my soul doth magnify the Lord. You have My prayer is in this song, I will sing it all my days, for all that is within me gives you praise. My soul doth magnify the Lord, my soul. We light the first Advent candle of Advent, the candle of hope to remind us of the hope that people of Israel had for the coming Messiah and for the hope that we need in our lives. We light the second candle of Advent, the candle of love, to remind us of the love that God has for us. The third candle is the candle, the joy candle. The candle, I'm sorry, the angel said to them, Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy, Luke 2.10. This announcement is ushered in the best news we have 
ever known. The Greek word for great is the word mega. This mega joy, supersized joy, brought first to the shepherds and then to others. Joy is the response of God's sovereignty, but joy is not happiness. It goes way beyond happy. Joy is not determined by outward circumstances. It is an inward reality. Christmas means that joy has come to us in Christ, and this joy cannot be taken away. Let us pray. God, thank you for the joy that comes only from Jesus. Help us to live our lives to your glory, knowing that Jesus will never leave us, that we can live without fear and be filled with joy. May we be found as the shepherds doing what you've called us to do with the constant joy that comes only from you. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Luke 1, 67 through 79, Zechariah's song. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Good morning again. Uh, please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you that no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what is going on in the world, no matter how we are feeling today, that because your son has come, we have hope. We have reason for hope. And Lord, we pray and thank you so much for reminders of that in this season, for reminders in song for reminders in your word. We pray that you would help us this morning to catch a glimpse again, anew, afresh of that hope, and that you would help us to see, to remember, rejoice in all that we have in you, because you have come. You are Emmanuel. You have come to redeem us. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Pray that you would help us this morning, pray that you would help me this morning too, uh, as we come to your word. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> the monks at a remote monastery deep in the woods followed a rigid vow of silence. Their vow could only be broken one time a year on Christmas by one monk, and that monk could speak only one sentence. One Christmas, Brother Thomas had his turn to speak and said, I love the delightful mashed potatoes that we have every year with the Christmas roast. And he sat down, and silence ensued for 365 days. The next Christmas, Brother Michael had his turn. He stood up and said, I think the mashed potatoes are lumpy, and I truly despise them sat down. Once again, silence for 365 days. The following Christmas, Brother Stephen rose and said, I am fed up with this constant bickering. 
I think it's hard for us to imagine not being able to talk for a long period of time. Even more, not being able to hear or speak for an extended period of time. To live in total, complete silence. You can't talk to your friends and family. Uh, The constant background drone that we are so used to in our culture of the TV or radio or music always being on is muted, turned off. We are in many ways addicted to noise. Even a a few minutes of silence can make people very uncomfortable. It's a frightening, intimidating prospect to be alone with our thoughts. So we scramble to fill that silence somehow with the radio or a podcast or a YouTube video or something. But if you could not hear or say anything, what would that mean for your life? What would you do instead? probably a lot more seeing things, noticing, observing things, a lot more looking into the eyes of your loved ones. When was the last time you looked steadily into someone's eyes? Probably a lot more thinking, pondering, more reading good books, more writing letters or your thoughts down, probably a lot more prayer and meditation on God's word all in uninterrupted, absolute silence and solitude. Mother Teresa once said, the beginning of prayer is silence. I mean, how often in our prayers do we kind of just rush in and rush out? We kind of, you know, rattle off our laundry list of requests, and then we're on to the next thing. How often do we sit in silence in the presence of God and just listen? couldn't hear or speak, there would be plenty of opportunity to do that. We are in the midst of our December sermon series entitled The Original Christmas Playlist. We are looking at four songs that we find in the Christmas story in the first two chapters of Luke's Gospel. Last week we looked at Mary's song, the song of our mindful and mighty God, where we are encouraged to let the truth that God is both all-caring and all-powerful, let your heart rejoice. And this week, we turn to Zechariah's song. It's found in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 67 through 79. I invite you to turn there with me if you haven't already. Uh, It's what came out of Zechariah's mouth after nine months of not being able to speak and, I believe, also not being able to hear. Back at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, we are introduced to Zechariah, who was a priest, and his wife Elizabeth. There we read in Luke 1, 6, and 7, Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. And an astute reader of the Old Testament, hearing that, has an idea of what's going to happen next. That just as God miraculously opened the womb and allowed for Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, Hannah, others to conceive, he was going to do that here. And so bless this older, faithful couple. And sure enough, before the angel Gabriel was sent to Mary, he had first visited Zechariah to announce that his wife would become pregnant and that their son John would have a very important job. He would grow up to verse 17, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John would be the warm-up act before the main event of the Messiah who was finally coming, but Zechariah had balked at that news. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't see it. A reminder that even mature, godly people, as he was, can miss it sometimes, can struggle, can fail. But God didn't toss him aside and just go on to the next godly older couple that was barren. Uh, No, in loving discipline, he put Zechariah in time out for nine months. (laughs) For nine months, he wouldn't be able to speak until the day all these things came to pass. Zechariah had nine months of silence to brood, to ponder, 
to pray, to ruminate, to meditate on his Bible, the Old Testament. I would guess that in the beginning he groaned, he was frustrated, even angry with his situation. But then, maybe gradually, in the silence of those months, Zechariah began to see, began to understand what was happening. It began to sink into his head and heart what wondrous, incredibly significant things were happening. Sometimes God has to quiet us so that we can hear him. Sometimes we have to be still so that we can see him more. And sometimes our words and busyness get in the way of our faith. It's been said that our suffering will either make us bitter or better, will drive us from God or to God, and it certainly made Zechariah better. Zechariah had learned probably more uh, about his own heart, about God, than he ever knew before during that time. And so when his son was born and the family and friends gathered for the baby's circumcision and naming, Zechariah was ready. The relatives who... I mean, they always seem to know better, don't they? That hasn't changed. They know better. They thought the boy ought to be named Zechariah Jr. But Elizabeth said that he was to be named John. So, but the relatives, again, don't agree. They have a better idea. So they go to Zechariah to ask him. And in verse 62, we read that they communicated to him with signs instead of speech. And that's why I think he had been struck both deaf and dumb. But Zechariah knew what was going on, and he wrote in no uncertain terms, in belief and embrace now of all the angel had said about this boy, his name is John. And as we read in verse 64 and six through 66, immediately his mouth was open and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And in the verses that follow, Zechariah prophesied by the Holy Spirit in answer of that question that they were all asking, What then is this child going to be? As he prophesied not just about his son, but about the bigger picture of what God was doing here. Uh, One can't help but think that the mind and heart of Zechariah during those nine months had been building toward this song, and now it was just ready to burst forth all at once, kind of like a a flower that suddenly just bursts out and opens where there was only a green bud yesterday. The theme of this song, as we'll see, is an encouragement for us to to embrace and rejoice in the reality of what God is doing here, to praise God because in his mercy he has come to redeem us. In Zechariah's song, we find four prompts, four reasons for us even today to praise God. You can't help but praise God when these four things happen to you as they did for Zechariah. The first is found in verses 67 through 69. You can't help but praise God when you recognize your need for redemption and how he meets it. Verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us, in the house of his servant David. This song centers on the idea of redemption. But unless we understand what that word means and why we need it, then the rest of this song won't matter. In normal, everyday conversations today, the term is, I think, probably more often used with sports than with Christianity. Whatever the sport, if a player really messed up if they flub something in a big game that cost their team the game the championship the season whatever it is he or she may live in infamy may have their error played and replayed on tv and in the minds of their fans but then that player may do something in another game or season that atones that covers over what they did before 
for their poor performance before, and they win redemption in the eyes of the fans or the media. They've redeemed themselves by this great thing. But this version of redemption requires that one must do something to make amends for past mistakes, that one must earn their way back into the good graces of others, that one needs to do enough that is significantly good to outweigh the bad that was done before. But our situation as presented in the Bible is much more desperate and dire than that. Far from being able to redeem ourselves, far from being able to work our way back into good graces or to do enough good to outweigh the bad, the Bible presents us as hopelessly and helplessly lost and dead. There is a brokenness there that we can never fix on our own. There's a a brokenness inside us and all around us in the world because of our sin. Sin is essentially... Me putting myself where God deserves to be. It's putting myself in the place of authority, of majesty, of running my own life, charting my own course. It's saying to God, whether very politely or extremely angrily, I don't want you. I don't want to obey your commandments. I'm not going to listen. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do it my way. I'm even going to sing a song about it. Literally, to sin is to miss the mark. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone misses the mark when it comes to glorifying, to recognizing, to pleasing, to loving, to following the God who made us and sustains us, who gives us everything we have. We have missed the mark. And we can miss the mark by an inch or by a mile, but nobody fails to miss that mark. Often we don't care whether we miss it or not. We aren't even aiming at living in a life that pleases, in a way that pleases God, but rather one that pleases ourselves. But even when we do care, when we do try to obey God, we still miss. Even on my best day, I still miss the mark of sin. Sin is something we choose, and yet sin is also something that traps us. Like a bad habit that's impossible to break, we are enslaved by what we've chosen. Even more than a bad habit, sin is our greatest problem. It causes alienation from others. It causes brokenness at the hands of others. It causes conflict with others. As each time we miss the mark, we spoil our own lives and uh, the lives of others around us. But it doesn't just spoil our relationship with others. It, It cripples your ability to know God and live for Him. You can't know God. You can't make your way back to God because you are trapped in your sin, enslaved by your sin. You're stuck with being separated from him both in your present and your eternal future. And because of all this brokenness that comes with our sin, all the ways that it separates us from God and fractures our relationships with others, because of all the ways that it renders us unable to be who God made us to be, because of all the ways that it blinds us and leaves us in a state of delusion, all the ways that it places us under his just judgment and leaves us completely hopeless. Because of all of this brokenness, we desperately need redemption that we cannot get on our own. Redemption is the act of providing a payment to free someone. And that's something we can never do for ourselves because of our sin. But in the opening lines of this song, Zechariah signals the wonderful news that God has come to his people, to redeem them. And in using this language, Zechariah is explaining God's work in this present situation by referencing God's work in the past, in the time of the Exodus, so many years and generations before. It was a time in which God's people, Israel, were stuck in Egypt, enslaved by Pharaoh. That, too, had been a situation that was hopeless and helpless, and we're not able to change that. But God had come to bring redemption. Despite Pharaoh's resistance, God had freed them through a series of plagues. The last plague had been the worst of all, that of death. The oldest son in each family would die, God warned, but also God provided a way out. 
through the blood, the death of a lamb. The lamb died. The people who trusted God lived. And Pharaoh, devastated by what his decision to resist God had done to the nation, let them go. God had powerfully, completely, miraculously redeemed his people out of the superpower in that time, Egypt. Back in Exodus 6.6, 6, God quotes, Mo, uh, Moses quotes God saying, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And that's what God did. And Zechariah says, after having nine months to think and pray and ponder all that God was up to in all of this, he sees it. He understands it now. And so he says, God is redeeming people all over again. Not from enslavement to an Egyptian king, but enslavement to their own sins. Zechariah says, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. The kind of horn meant here is not a musical instrument, uh, but an instrument of death, of weapon, of a uh, wild, a horn of a wild ox. We see this image come up in other Old Testament passages too, like Psalm 92, 9 and 10. For surely your enemies, Lord, surely your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Or Psalm 18, 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The horn is a sign of strength and means victory. For the psalmist, God is his defense, his shield, and also his offense, his deadly and powerful horn. God is a horn of salvation because he uses his power to secure and protect his people, to redeem them from their helpless and hopeless state. Jesus did not come to be an add-on to your life. He didn't come to be a free download app that makes things better or more convenient for you. He didn't come just to help you put the bits and pieces of your life together in a way that's more efficient or effective or successful. He didn't come to make us more religious or more nice. He didn't even come to make us more happy or successful. He came because you were drowning, pulled down by the weight of your sin, and you were miles from shore. If you're drowning, it doesn't help for somebody to come alongside of you in a boat and say, well, come on. I mean, keep swimming. Thrash around a little bit more. Try harder. Get yourself together. Get yourself out of that mess. No, you need somebody to reach down their hand to grasp yours and pull you up to safety and take you to shore. And if you're drowning, you don't refuse the person whose hand is offered to you. You grasp it and you sputter your gratitude. And that's what is happening with Zechariah. Maybe like never before in these last nine months, he has come to recognize his need for redemption. And how God was coming to meet that need. He knows that his son, John, will spend his life saying, hold on, God is coming. He's almost here, and he will rescue you. And in view of that, Zechariah can't help but praise God. And the same is the case with us. When we come face to face with our great need because of our sin, when we see how black and awful and inexcusable it is, and then we come to see and recognize how God has come to redeem us out of all of that. How he has come and he has met our need for redemption in Christ. When we see that we too can't help but praise God. But let's keep moving. I want to spend some more time on that first point because in some ways it's the most important. And because if we don't get that and recognize our need and how God meets that, then nothing else of the rest of the song is going to matter to us. So praise God in his mercy he has come to redeem us. You can't help but praise him when you recognize your need for redemption and how he meets it. But also, secondly, you can't help but praise God when you understand his commitment 
to his people. We saw this theme in Mary's song as well, where she invites us to celebrate that God's plans are perfect, that he always keeps his promises. And in Zechariah's song, in some ways, we have the same song, just the second verse, because he picks up where Mary left off and hits on some of the same notes. Again, let me read verse 68 through 73. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. As I mentioned last week, it had been 400 years since God had last spoken to his people. Empires had risen and fallen in the meantime. The promise and expectations raised in the Old Testament were still just kind of hanging there, unfulfilled. But there was no fresh word from God, no update, no patch, no modifications, just silence. And it would have been easy for people to cynically think that God had moved on or forgotten about his people and his promises. But then God sent an angel to Zechariah. Do you know what the name Zechariah means? I mean, I love this. This is great. Zechariah was a common name in those days. There are multiple Zechariahs in the Bible. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the first words from God to his people in 400 years, would come to somebody whose name means the Lord has remembered. I mean, come on. God's just showing off here. It probably didn't seem like it to the Jewish people living under Roman rule that the Lord had remembered them, but he did. And just as he had remembered his people in Egypt after another 400 years of silence there, so he still remembered them now and was coming again to redeem them, to fulfill every commitment and promise he had made to them. And Zechariah in his song calls to mind all these many promises God had made to his people and how they were all now coming true in Christ. He points to David, to the holy prophets of long ago, even way back to Abraham and the patriarchs and the covenants God had made with them. Why does Zechariah mention all this? Because he's celebrating the plan and purposes of God. He now understands, maybe like never before, God's commitment to his people. He sees all the connections, all the promises are now coming true. And Zechariah can't help but praise God because of it. The entire Old Testament, from Abraham to the prophets to King David, is pointing ahead to one thing, to Jesus and the salvation of that he alone could and would bring. The Bible really boils down to one story of God visiting, God coming to redeem his people in Christ. That was and is the plan. Jesus showed this to the disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, as we read in Luke 24, 27, how Jesus began with, the pro- the, with Moses and all the prophets and explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. It all pointed to Jesus. Every promise of salvation and help, every commitment God had made was coming true in him. This salvation had multiple parts to it, as we see in the whole of Zechariah's song. One part is to save Israel from their enemies, from the hand of all their haters. This is an actual political, physical rescue, but that's not all, as we'll see more. There's also a personal, spiritual salvation clearly pointed to as well. Now, it was probably beyond what Zechariah could see or understand at the time that these parts of that coming salvation wouldn't happen all at once, that this national political deliverance wouldn't happen with Christ's first coming, but only in his second. But all of it, all these promises were coming true, would come true in Christ. And seeing that, understanding that, prompted Zechariah to praise God for his commitment, for his remembering of his people and promises. He is the God who remembers. And as we grow in our relationship with God and come to see and understand how God is working 
through scripture, even in our own day, will prompt us to praise him as well. God has not redeemed us on a whim. It was not an impulse buy at the convenience store checkout line that, ah, well, just throw that on there too. It was not a package deal that, well, we were just kind of the throw-in add-ons to. No, this was the eternal, perfect plan of God worked out through centuries and generations. He chose us in Christ before even the creation of the world, we read in Ephesians 1. That is the level of commitment that God has made to his people, that we would be his. That was his plan. He made it long ago, and that perfect plan was worked out through all of this, even at great cost to himself. That's his commitment. Man, praise God in his mercy. He has come to redeem us. You can't help but praise God when you recognize your need for redemption and how he meets it. You can't help but praise God when you understand his commitment to his people. But thirdly, that you can't help but praise God when you embrace the role you and others get to play in his story. Verse 74, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Here we see the purpose of our redemption. And it's not so that, okay, we're free now. We can just put up our feet in freedom and do whatever we want now, right? That's, I mean, that's our country's thing. Like, we are free. We can do what we want. this This is our thing. But biblically... That's not our thing. (laughs) We are set free for a purpose greater than that. We have been set free to serve and worship God. Back in the Exodus, God had told Moses to go tell Pharaoh in Exodus 7.16, let my people go, not so that they can go do whatever they want, let my people go so that they may worship me. And so now Christ has come to redeem and save us so that we might worship and serve him. Freedom is a good goal, but it's not the ultimate goal. Freedom is just a means to that greater end that we may use our freedom to worship and serve God. As Paul encourages us in Galatians 5.13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Or Peter in 1 Peter 2.16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Or read in Romans 6. Or 1 Peter 2.9, a little earlier in 1 Peter 2. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God has redeemed us. He has set us free. He has made us his chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, special possession, so that we might declare the praises who, who has done all this for us, who has called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. He has set us free that we might serve and worship him, that with our life, our words, our actions, we might make him known and share his love as we serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days, Zechariah says. And in verse 76 and 77, Zechariah points to how his son would do that, to the role that he would get to play in God's unfolding story of redemption. There we read, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation, through the forgiveness of their sins. I mean, how many times had Zechariah prayed to be able to have a kid? How long had he and Elizabeth been waiting? How excited, I mean, once he got over his doubt that this was actually going to happen, how excited must he have been that this was happening? 
this long-awaited son was coming. And yet, even with all that excitement, all the stuff that's happening around, leading into this song is about his son, he's circumcised, getting named. But this song, did you notice, is a whole lot more about God and Jesus than it is about his son, even his long-awaited son. It's only later here that he finally gets around to what this all would mean for his son and the part that John would play in what God was doing. Why did it take Zechariah so long to get around to talking about his son? Because he understood that it wasn't about Zechariah or Elizabeth or Mary or Joseph or John. It was about Jesus. And yes, all those other people and more had their roles to play and they could rejoice in all they got to contribute to the song of redemption that God was writing in and through their lives, but they weren't the main thing. Jesus was. John would spend his whole life telling people Jesus was the main thing. And his dad, Zechariah, gets him started on that even here in this song. John would be great. He would be called a prophet of the Most High. He would be a forerunner, the opening act to the main show. He would be sent ahead of the Savior to make things ready for him by teaching people how they could be saved. John's work was to prepare the way, to, to prime the pump, to break up the hard soil so that the message of the gospel coming fully in Christ could be heard and received. His whole life's purpose would be a giant index finger pointing the way to God's salvation found in Christ. All this fulfilled one of the last prophecies before those 400 years of silence. We find it in Malachi 3.1 and 4.5. And it said that God would send his messenger in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Messiah. And here in John, God is fulfilling that promise too. Check that one off. Malachi pointed ahead to John, and Zechariah said, the one Malachi pointed ahead to is here in this baby boy who has come to point ahead to Jesus. And really, if you think about it, that's what we are called to as well. We're called to point to Jesus. In our worship, our service to God that we have been set free from sin to do, the greatest, the most important way that we can worship and serve God is by pointing people to Jesus. Zechariah's prophecy defines John's life in relationship to Jesus' life and his mission. And if you are looking for real meaning and purpose in your life, you're not going to find that looking within. I'm sorry. I know we're told that in our culture. But you're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it in yourself. You're not going to find it just orbiting around yourself more and more. You find that lasting meaning, and purpose when we embrace that life isn't about us, that we are not the center of the universe, but that we get to know and serve and love the one who is who life is all about, who is at the center of the universe. Greatness and meaning and purpose in our life comes from serving the Lord, not from serving ourselves, from saying with John, as he would say later on, I must decrease, and Jesus must increase. Zechariah couldn't help but praise God because he embraced the role he and others around him, namely his son, got to play in God's story. What an honor it is for us to, to serve the king, to bring a message of hope and life to those in desperate need, to be able to point people to Jesus by our words and actions in a thousand little ways every day. Parents, you get the honor of being the primary disciplers of your kids, of being the people God has placed in their life on the front line to be able to point to him. What an honor. What a joy to do that. Adults in your jobs, kids in your schools, you get the honor of being a representative of Jesus in your workplace and school. You get the opportunity every day to point people to Jesus and how you talk to them, how you treat people, how you respond to challenges, how you speak life and encouragement and hope into other people's lives. What an honor.
honor that is. And when we see that whatever our job is, whatever our life situation is, whatever the relationships that we have are, God has placed us in them for a reason. And when we embrace the role that we get to play in the story God is writing in those places and with those people, it infuses your life and work with purpose. You can't help but praise God for it. Praise God in his mercy. He has come to redeem us. You can't help but praise God when you recognize your need for redemption and how he meets it. When you understand his commitment to his people. When you embrace the role that you and others get to play in his story. And finally, you can't help but praise God when you grasp the greatness of what redemption brings. I mean, we could spend a whole other sermon or series of sermons on just this. But I will limit myself to the highlights of verses 77 through 79, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercies of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. In his mercy, God has come to redeem us and that doesn't just mean taking away the negative stuff of sin and death and judgment. There is also an inbreaking of so much good. Here is the the Kool-Aid guy bursting through the wall of all the goodness and oh yeah-ness of the salvation that God is bringing and the redemption and all the wonder that comes with it. And when you grasp the greatness of what redemption brings, you can't help but praise God. First, we see that it brings forgiveness of our sins in verse 77. John was coming to point to Jesus and the way we can be saved. Well, how was that? What way was that? What do we need to be saved from? Well, as we mentioned, from our sins, from God's just judgment against our sin. But in Jesus, when we turn from our sin and turn to trust him as our Savior and Lord, when we do that, we find forgiveness for all our sin. Jesus lived the perfect life we never could. He died in our place on the cross, taking the punishment that we deserve so that we could be set free from sin and death and we could be washed clean, we could be purified, we could be forgiven forever, never again a slave to sin, never again shackled by the chains of guilt because of the promise. 1 John 1, 9 is one of them. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In Christ we find forgiveness and salvation because of what he did in the cross and resurrection in mercy We could never earn or deserve or demand. God has gifted it to us in Christ. But not just that. We also see that redemption brings light. Verse 78, through the mercy of God, we also receive light because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Jesus is the sunrise, the day spring, bursting into the darkness and gloom and despair. In our sin, we sit in darkness like prisoners locked in an underground dungeon. But when Christ comes into our lives, he brings light. He is the light of the world, after all. Whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And with that light, light comes life and hope. As all of a sudden everything shines and darkness flees and death is defeated and fear is gone. As Paul put it in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, hitting on some of the same notes that we hear in Zechariah's song. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption brings forgiveness, light, finally peace. Jesus has come to guide our feet into the path of peace. That's something we all long for. We don't want the way of worry and war. We don't want the way of anxiety and fear. We don't want the way of rebellion and restlessness. 
Deep down in our bones, we long for the way of peace. We think we can get it a lot of different ways. We think if everybody would just listen to me, if I could just be in control, that this or that would happen, then I could have peace. But that's not how it happens. Jesus is the only way. In him we find peace with God and with one another. In him we find a way that is characterized not just by the absence of conflict, but by peace, by, by shalom, by wholeness and goodness and life as it was always meant to be. And when you grasp the greatness of what redemption brings, that it brings forgiveness and light and peace and so much more, you can't help but praise God like Zechariah. When was the last time you basked in the wonder of what God's redemption has brought to your life? The last time you thank God for the wonder of his full and audaciously free forgiveness for you? When was the last time you rejoiced in the light he has brought into your life that has broken in and broken up the ignorance and fear and darkness and despair? When was the last time you praised God that you don't have to walk in the way of selfishness and greed and constant conflict with others anymore? Christ has shown you a better way now, the way of peace. How great is that? Praise God in his mercy. He has come to redeem us. I would encourage you this Christmas season. I want to give you a homework assignment. You say, Pastor, I have too much to do already. I know. I know. We all do. But this might be the most important thing you do this Christmas season. I would encourage you to find some time to just be quiet. And that's hard. That's a challenge, man. That's, I mean, everything else, crowds in. We have all these things that we need to do. We get reminders of our socks that need to be sorted and, you know, all these things that we need to email and check and what message and whatever. But I would encourage you to make it a priority to find some time in the next few weeks to just be quiet. To go off by yourself somewhere, maybe somewhere outside. To turn off the noise. Don't bring your phone with you. And just spend some time in the presence of God in silence. And as you do that, as you spend some time, I would encourage you to prayerfully think about your need for redemption and how God has met that need. To spend some time turning over in your mind the story of the Bible. God's plan and promises that are fulfilled in Christ. Of spending some time in embracing the role that you get to play in God's story. Spend some time counting the benefits of redemption, grasping with your heart and mind the greatness of all that it brings. And when you do that, I think you're going to find that just like Zechariah, after that time spent in silence, ruminating on that, considering all that, that you will not be able to help but say, praise God. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have come, that you have come not in anger, not in judgment, not in retribution and vindictive punishment, but you have come to redeem us. You have come to bring us back to you. And we thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to find that space, to find that time in the next few weeks to come into your presence, to be quiet, to remember these things, and to rejoice in who you are and what you have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand as we close. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive our King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world. Stick around for Sunday School at 1030. Just a reminder that we have our annual meeting back up here at 1130. And teachers, if you could help us out with that and not go over and dismiss a little early even to encourage people to come on up, that would be great. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.